And today we're going to talk about pet aggression. I have so many people that write in and tell me that their kids are hitting the cats, pulling the cats, pinching the cats. So today we're going to check in with Bianca. And Bianca says that her two and a half year old son is too rough with the cat. He kicks her, he hits her, he sits on her, and he pulls her tail. I tell him that it's not nice and that we don't hit animals or people because he's been doing that as well. And I explain to him that he's hurting her. If he continues, I tell him that he's going in his room and if he hurts her again and hits her again, I follow up by putting him in his room. I need for him to be kind to the cat and to listen to me when I ask him to do so. I don't know what he needs, but I think he probably just wants to play with her. All right, Bianca, this, I have to tell you, this is so, so common. Kids, you know, between the ages of two and four in those early years, aggression is really, really common. This is such a typical behavior for any two to four-year-old. And I have to tell you that it's going to be your responsibility to not only reaffirm that limit, but also be responsible for the animals by keeping them away from the children during these aggressive phases. Um, you are really taking a risk expecting a two or three or even four-year-old to control his impulses towards the animals when he has um, a desire to express his curiosity or his play. You can really check out the brain science to learn about his development and what keeps him from just listening to you when you ask him to do so. But that ability to stop and think is barely online at this age. And unfortunately, it doesn't develop any faster with timeouts or stern reprimands or punishment or consequences. And that's because the developing brain requires your respectful attention and your presence, but also lots and lots of repetition to secure a connection like that. So today I'm going to share with you four tips for keeping the kids and the pets safe. All right, my first tip is to know what you need. In order for you to be able to stay regulated, calm, composed, compassionate, you have to be able to identify what you need. The way to identify what you need is to ask yourself, what quality is missing from my experience right now? If you answer by naming what you want someone else to do, I need him to be kind to the cat or I need him to listen to me when I ask him to do so, then you know you haven't really hit on your real need yet. Knowing what you need helps you self-regulate so that you can be a guide in this situation without relying on anyone else to change your emotional state. So your real need may be for safety. You want to make sure that the cat is okay. You may have a need for peace. You want to end the conflict. You may have a need for understanding. You would like to have your wishes and your feelings about the cat understood, right? So once you know what you need, then you can go on to meeting those needs on your own while your child develops his ability to make good decisions. One does not rely on the other. So how do you meet your needs without your child having to change? Take preventative measures. You want to control the environment so that you can meet your needs without anybody else's help and so that you can create an environment that your child can actually succeed in. So be proactive. Instead of, if you hurt the cat one more time, you're going to your room, try something like, it looks like you're having some trouble controlling your body. You know, I can't be here to keep you both safe, so I'm gonna put the cat in my bedroom for now so that you won't be tempted to touch her. Or something like, I know you'd like to play with the cat. Do you see how she reacts when you pull her tail? She doesn't like it. So I'm going to let the cat play outside while we stay inside for now. You know, and some people may say, well, I can't always put the cat somewhere. Or is it fair to the other children to do that? But if you change nothing and expect your child to just comply without making supportive gestures, it leads to frustration and ultimately setting you both up for disappointment. You can adjust the environment to make it easier for your child to practice his emerging skills. And this isn't giving in to bad behavior, but actually letting your child know, hey, you're having some trouble. Let me see how I can help you. Okay, my third tip is become interested in your child's world. There are so many reasons for pet aggression, the need for attention, for tension relief, for play. But when you go in and you automatically make determinations of guilt, look what you just did again. Didn't I just tell you? Shut your child down to, have, to anything else that you have to offer because you can't build connection with guilt or punishment or shame. You can only build it with non-judgmental observation and curiosity. So I want you to be interested in your child's experience. Save your lectures for when children are receptive to hearing them. And make sure that you're giving children information which they are developmentally able to process. A two-year-old does not have the same ability to remember rules or plan or predict consequences as an older child. So that's the reason for six trips to the naughty mat, because your child just isn't developmentally ready to handle this kind of a demand on his own. It's up to you. It isn't that, he's, that he isn't listening or he's bad. It's just that he can't remember in the moment to change course because he's too little. His brain doesn't work that way. So I want you to stop focusing on behavior or making judgments like that. Isn't nice? There's always a time and a place for teaching lessons and logic, but that behavioral focus 
is not going to get you anywhere with an aggressive child. I want you to shift your attention to, to making and building an emotional connection with your child in these moments. So instead of repeating that's not nice or we don't hit cats or people, which doesn't give a lot of valuable information or feedback to a child and it ignores that communication, I want you to go in there instead and be curious. Observe. You're pulling the cat's tail and it doesn't look like she likes that. Or I see you sitting on the cat as you gently remove him. You know, that tells me that you have some angry feelings that are maybe stuck in your body and they need to come out. Or I know when you start kicking the cat that you're feeling overwhelmed. Be curious. I'm wondering if you're doing that because you would like me to play and I'm holding the baby right now. Or she sure does react in a funny way when you pull her tail. I bet you'd like it if she didn't run away from you. You just want to play with her. Right? Or it looks like you want to play with the cat and she's not understanding. You know, tell me more about your idea. What is it that you wanted to do with the cat? You know, what does this do? It doesn't deny the reality of the situation. It doesn't dismiss behavior, but it gets your child's attention through your interest in his world. When your child feels like he has something to contribute or someone to connect to, he's more likely to give you more information. So I want you to resist that logic that's coming up or those thoughts that I'm bad, he's bad, he's asking too much, he should just learn, which leads us to those knee-jerk responses like, I know you want to play, but you can't right now. Can't you see I'm holding the baby with frustration or impatience, right? Or I know you're upset, but you can't hit the cat. Just breathe through that. Instead, be happy. Be even excited about his needs. If his need is for your attention, say, I'd love to play with you too. I wish I could play all day and never have to go to work or never have to feed the baby. I wish you could just do it all and I could play with you. If your child's really small, use your whole full body to let him know how much you understand his experience. It doesn't mean that you have the intention or the ability to fulfill that desire, but it lets your child know that you're connected. You know, tell me about an adventure that we could go on all day if we, if we didn't have to work, if I didn't have to go to work. What would we do? All right, my final tip is find the growth opportunity. Sometimes the reason for aggression is that there's a lot of pent up frustration or anger. Some of you have said that you've previously used timeouts or spanking or yelling. So you wanna make sure that you take time each day or each week for your child to get out those tears and fears that are hiding underneath all that aggression. A child who's already exhibiting aggression is not going to feel any relief from punitive or harsh handling or an impatient or frazzled, what were you thinking? You know, this is actually going to increase the tension and sends the message that the situation is unsafe and ever changing. The emotional climate is the best predictor of whether you are building trust and tolerance or deepening the conflict by actually missing the root causes. If we skip the emotional part of conflict resolution, we don't give ourselves or our kids the chance to find that growth opportunity because we can't learn or grow from a place of stress or tension or fear. So we need to go deeper. Some kids push and pull or hit for attention because they have this backlog of emotions and unmet needs. And some kids have trouble with their bodies because they have sensory needs, which require things like deep pressure or tickling or roughhousing to get out. You know, roughhouse play is a really great way for kids to meet their physical and emotional needs so you can gently and playfully engage your child physically when they get aggressive. You know, I think you need more hugs or, or for example, my daughter for years, she loved us to play the gingerbread cookie game. So when she got really aggressive and I've been through the hitting people and animals and me and all of that phases, so I've been there. And when she would get aggressive, I would address her physical needs by making the cookie game our pattern interrupt for this aggression. So whenever I saw that glimmer of aggression, I would scream, time for cookies, and I'd go grab her and I'd pick her up. Okay, we're coming out of the, the dough is coming out of the fridge, and I'd plop her down, and I'd roll her out, and I'd smooth her out, and all of these silly ways which got us to connect, right? And then that got her receptive to what I'd have to offer. And then, you know, I'd decorate the cookie up, and finally I'd eat it up, and I'd kiss her all over. She needed my physical attention and my presence, and also that sensory pressure and that physicality to process the feelings out of her body. And I did this physical work with her because it was clear that her aggression was not usually about the conflict that we were having in that moment, but about these powerful feelings that were rising up in her that she didn't know what to do with. And no amount of telling me, of me telling her how to be or to be nice was going to work. She needed to have an outlet. She needed to walk me to walk her through that process of easing the overwhelm. So don't be afraid to use play when your kids get aggressive with animals. It's not saying that the behavior is okay. We find the growth opportunity when we can withstand that pain of the struggle just long enough to take us to a new place. So this is the kind of calm, 
confident quality information that you and your child can use so that he will eventually be able to adapt his behaviors. So Bianca, that was my teachable moment for you. I hope that you found it helpful. And of course, I would love to know. So be sure to send me an email update on your family's growth. And of course, if you like this video, please do me a favor and share it with a friend or click like below. And also leave me a comment. I want to hear from you guys. How do you help your child manage his anger or aggression? And then be sure to visit me over at my website at teachthroughlove.com and get on the list so that you don't miss another episode of our Teachable Moments. And another reason to get on that list is that I'm about to open enrollment for my eight-week online parenting series, which is coming this August. I only run this program twice a year, and our last session of 2013 is already a promise. I can't believe it. This course is going to be 50 days of conscious parenting, weekly live video classes, um, a private forum for you to interact and be supported by lots of like-minded folks. So sign up for my emails and you will get all the fabulous details as soon as they are released. Until next time, everybody, please remember it is about consciousness, not perfection.